be very careful that when God himself appears in a diminutive form, even the form of a dwarf or a midget or a child, still you must not think that you are powerful because of your size. So this chapter, chapter 22, takes us all the way up to when Bali Maharaj is uh, uh, he's in the, he's, he's wrapped up in ropes. Garuda wraps up him in, in ropes. But then we shall see a very distinct change within him as he actually performs the great surrender, the great uh, Sharanagati, the great uh, Prapanna, becomes a great Prapanna. And he becomes lauded by us as uh, one of the Mahajans. So the verses for today is verse Canto 8, chapter 22. And then we have 34, 35, 36, and 36 has the purport. Canto 8, chapter 22, verses 34, 35, 36. Na tuam abibavishanti loke sha kimutapare twach cha sanagatin dait jangs chakra me sutta yashiti. And this is the Lord Vamanadev telling him, Bali, where he will be placed. On the planet Sutala, not even the predominating deities of other planets, what to speak of ordinary people will be able to conquer you. As far as the demons are concerned, if they transgress your rule, my disc will kill them. Very interesting. Rakshishe Sarvato Hantuam Sanugam Saparichadam Sada Sanihitang Vira Tatramam Drakshate Bhavan. O great hero, <clears throat> I shall always be with you and give you protection in all respects, along with your associates and paraphernalia. Moreover, you will always be able to see me there. And today's verse with purport. Tatradhanava daityanam sangate bhava asura drishtva mad anubhavan chvai sadhya kunto vinangshati. Because there you will see my supreme prowess. Your materialistic ideas and anxieties that have arisen from your association with the demons and Dhanavas will immediately be vanquished. Srila Prabhupada's purport. The Lord assured Bali Maharaj of all protection. And finally, the Lord assured him of protection from the effects of bad association with the demons. Bali Maharaj certainly became an exalted devotee, but he was somewhat anxious because his association was not purely devotional. The Supreme Personality of Godhead therefore assured him that his demoniac mentality would be annihilated. In other words, by the association of devotees, the demoniac mentality is vanquished. Satang prasangan mamavirya sangvido bhavanti hritkarana Rasayana Kata, Shima Bhagavatam, third canto, 25th chapter, 25th verse. When a demon associates with devotees engaged in glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he gradually becomes a pure devotee. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the eighth canto, 22nd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Bali Maharaj surrenders his life. Mamagyana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shilakaya Chakshur Unminitam Jena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai um, There are many, many accounts of the story of Bali Maharaj. The story of Vamana Dev goes all the way back to the uh, Rig Veda. It is one of the 
earliest stories and one of the most told stories in all of the Vedas. So it's very famous. The Srimad Bhagavatam, the version given to us in Srimad Bhagavatam, is not simply the, the narrative of how the demon king surrendered to an incarnation of Vishnu who came to him in the form of a dwarf, but it also mentions the process for becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. And if we go into the next chapter, not that I will do, but in the next chapter, we see that um, the Srimad Bhagavatam records the feelings of Bali Maharaj by saying that when he was talking to Krishna in the form of this dwarf Brahmin known as Vamanadev, his eyes were filled with tears and his voice was choking up. These are the feelings, not of a person who has been simply defeated, but they're the prayers or the prayerful feelings of a, a pure devotee. And Prabhupada comments on this. So Srimad Bhagavatam likes to point to us both the uh, symptoms of being a pure devotee of Krishna, because that's what the book is all about. All of the thousands and thousands of verses in Srimad Bhagavatam help us to understand what pure devotion to Krishna is and what it's not. So um, Srimad Bhagavatam does this. It tells us about the symptoms of a pure devotee, but also it tells us how to achieve that for ourselves. This is the stated purpose of the book in the very beginning, all the way through to the end. And of course, the chief means of doing this is to always recite the glories, characteristics, beauty, fame, compassion, love, and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, either in his eternal abode or when he makes his appearance in this world. So starts at the very beginning, the name of Krishna, and at the end of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is the name of Krishna, and everywhere in between, it's removing obstacles to the name of Krishna, or you're taking up the name of Krishna as a serious practice in your life. And twice in this chapter 22, what's brought out for us is uh, once, of course, through the purports of Srila Prabhupada, but also once through the comments of Vamana Dev, and another time through the comments of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj earlier on, he says, he says, my great, uh, meaning my worshipable uh, grandfather, Prahlad Maharaj, uh, he was, uh, he was not afraid of anything, but he was afraid of association with the uh, mad, uh, demonic um, materialists with whom he shared a family and with whom he shared a school. So um, Robert makes the comment that um, a, a pure devotee is never afraid, but he's afraid of becoming uh, covered over, contaminated by the association of mundane persons who are mad after material life. Nunam uh, pramata kurute vikarma. People in the world are mad after the pleasures of the body and the mind, whether they are gross pleasures or whether they are subtle pleasures. He said the, the, the people who identify with the gross material body and the subtle material body, uh, they seek their happiness in the world in certain ways. And any threat to that uh, brings about great fear and anxiety. Uh, there's an anxiety that uh, <laughs> you know, when one is attacked, when one uses the body as an instrument of happiness and does not know any other happiness, then what happens is that any attack on the body, even the attack of uh, someone who's there to take away your fame or your uh, good reputation or your, um, your, your physical strength or your, uh, you know, your wealth, uh, that person will be seen as an enemy and you'll always be in anxiety uh, about that person. 
And um, this, of course, is material intelligence. One, one time, it, it may have been New York, I don't know, but, but Prabhupada was asking about one uh, young lady who had come to the temple several times. And uh, she showed some interest. And Prabhupada was always, um, in the beginning, had enough uh, closeness with the young people that were coming that he was able to inquire individually about their welfare. So he said, uh, how is this, how is she doing? Is she coming to Krishna consciousness? And the devotees told him, they said, well, she is a little bit Prabhupada, but she doesn't seem very serious. And he said, well, please ask her why she is not so serious about Krishna consciousness. And they came back to him and they said, she said, she said that, um, she knows that if she becomes serious about Krishna consciousness, she will have to say goodbye to her material life. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, she said, he said, uh, oh, she is very intelligent. <laughs> Meaning, you've made that calculation. Meaning, a person who is intelligent looks towards the future and thinks, what are the future consequences of my present activities? Unfortunately, um, a person who is only intelligent in a mundane way looks only towards the future of the material body. Robert said it's like a man who he sees another man sitting on the branch of a tree and he's trying to collect firewood. So he's sawing the branch of the tree. <laughs> but he's cutting away at the branch of the tree in between where he's sitting and the trunk. And the, the, the gentleman calls up to him. He said, my dear sir, he said, if you keep cutting the branch, he said, you'll fall and you'll hurt yourself. And the man becomes very annoyed at him. He says, uh, he, he, he shouts down to him. He said, my dear friend, he said, he said, what are you, some great, uh, some great uh, astrologer? Can you tell the future? Do you know what's going to happen to me in the future? <laughs> Get away with you. So he walks on down the road, and of course, as he's walking down the road, he hears this, <laughs> and then he rushes back to help the man. And the man looks at him and he says, "He says, my dear friend, he says, how did you know? How did you know what was going to happen? How did you know? How did you know the future?" So um, it's like when we go to um, a, a, a doctor. And we say, doctor, I have a pain in my stomach. And he asks us a few questions. And he says, oh, take, take one of these three times a day and uh, stay off the, you know, don't eat any more of this. And then we say to the doctor, but how do you know me? How do you know me personally? I mean, we've only just met. <laughs> just five minutes ago, I walked in here. And now you're telling me what to do with my life. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know what? So the doctor knows. He knows by the symptoms. And from his symptoms, it's possible to tell the future. So when a person's up a tree, I judge by the symptoms that when he's cutting a branch, he's going to fall and he's going to hurt himself. If I'm a doctor, I look at the situation and I think, if this person doesn't stop eating sugar or meat, or alcohol, then this person's stomach is not going to uh, get better. And so I restrict his diet and I give him some medicine. So then now, then is not the time for a person to say, well, I'm in ignorance. How is it that you are in ignorance too? No, the ignorant should go to the knowledgeable. The fools should go to the wise. And the wise should always be careful and compassionate to distribute their wisdom to others. And this is the message of the Bhagavatam, the ultimate book of wisdom. And it begins with disconcerting news. Uh, life is short. And ultimately, whatever you achieve will be taken away from you. Uh, what a miserable book. <laughs> what, what, a, what a miserable book. I want to read a book of, you know, how to be, how to be rich quick, how to be happy and healthy, how to be, you know, a... Um, how to make money on the uh, on Wall Street, how to um, 
you know, attract uh, women, how to be very beautiful and famous, how to be a, an internet sensation. Write a book on those things and then give it to me and I'll read that. Don't give me a book which starts off that I'm going to get old, sick and die and everything that I have will be taken away from me. But ultimately, Vedanta is like that. Vedanta says, Atato Brahma Jignasa, now that you have the human form of life, now is the time to start thinking about higher happiness. How to understand higher happiness? It's by understanding who you are. And who you are is the self within the body. And in the same way as a, uh, a little musk deer cannot smell or uh, does not know the origin of the beautiful fragrance, in the same way, we do not always understand the, the origin of the happiness that we're seeking is actually deep within us. So that's what Vedanta does. That's what the Upanishads do. And that's what Srimad Bhagavatam continues. So after the bad news comes the good news. So the bad news is, I'm afraid you're sick. You've got a stomach complaint. However, the good news is, <laughs> here's the medicine that will fix it. So this is Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the bad news. The good news is there's a life of joy uh, awaiting you, but just something that you have to do. In the past, you were very afraid of happiness being taken away from you when it was based on your body. In the future, I want your fear only to, only to be concentrated on those persons who may challenge your understanding of yourself as a spirit soul. So for a devotee, uh, devotee, we concentrate on two types of fear. And this verse is about fear in one sense, because it's about the type of fear that we should not have and the type of fear that we should. So um, I, I think I told you last time I went through a period of great fear uh, this is where we left the conversation last time, if I remember, in New York. That a doctor came to me who was looking after me. And he said, um, you have cancer. I said, oh, how long have I got? He said, well, he said, um, if the problem isn't fixed, you have about 18 months. If we, um, if we have uh, some treatment, if it hasn't gone too far, then we can fix it. So from the time he told me that to the time I was diagnosed was a period of great fear because it was a period when I discovered how attached I am to the material body that I have. Now, this shouldn't have been the case. I have been learning that I'm not my body for many, many decades, not even years, decades. And I've been teaching it to others. So you would expect that of all people, I would be the most convinced that whatever happens is Krishna's will and that I'm not my body and I will experience joy whether I'm dead or whether I'm alive. But you would be surprised even after practicing Krishna consciousness and repeating the words, you are not your body, how attached to the body you can still become. You can still be. And part of it was that it was an arrangement that I didn't think should have happened. In my mind, I was praying to Krishna, my dear Lord Krishna, you should not have given me this problem. I'm one of the people that you said you would protect. You said, Sarva Dharavan Parichaja, Mam Ekam Sharanambraja, I surrender to you and uh, Rakshishati, I accepted you as my protector and um, you have not protected me. So there's a great fear. And part of me had to surrender. A little part of me had to, well, not a little part, a big part had to surrender. And I just had to accept that this is Krishna's will for me at this particular time. And this is part of his protection. And if not, then either uh, I become a complete materialist believing that there is no protection from Krishna, or I become a spiritualist, 
And I think to myself, yes, the material body is here today, gone tomorrow anyway. So why am I worried? So the gap between Krishna, why have you done this? And Krishna, I accept this. And thank you very much for helping me to bridge that gap was a few, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying given the same situation that I wouldn't be thinking the same thing today. But it was a, it was a great problem for me. So Bali Maharaj, the great king, he's in this situation. He's a king who's very worried. First of all, his main emotion is that his, uh, his half, half brother, you could say, not his half brother, but he's the, uh, Bali Maharaj is a descendant of uh, Kashapa and uh, Diti. And uh, Indra uh, is the, who killed his father, is the uh, descendant of Kashapa and uh, Diti and Aditi. And so um, you can understand that Bali is fearing, uh, he, first of all, he's, he's feeling very uh, great animosity towards Indra for killing his father. Uh, and uh, you can say rightly too, because uh, the battle between the, the demons and the demigods is always going on. Uh, but this time, the uh, uh, the uh, the Daichas, descendants of Diti, actually won, and Bali Maharaj was in charge of the entire uh, universe, and so he conquers Indra, and uh, he's he's very successful, and then of course, um, Krishna in his incarnation as Vamana comes and makes rearrangements. So he takes three steps or two steps and says, where shall I place my third step? And Bali Maharaj at that moment, he knows that his time is up. His time is up as a conqueror because he's been conquered. And being a greatly, um, uh, a great demigod-like person, and coming from a very noble family, he has, um, you know, he has Prahlad Maharaj as his grandfather. And he knows that Prahlad Maharaj was equally uh, protected by the Lord. And in his confrontation with the Lord, there was nothing but love. So deep down, Bali Maharaj knows this is my moment of surrender. And he takes that moment and he surrenders. And he's immediately protected by the Lord and elevated by him. So Bali Maharaj is sort of our emblem, if you like. He's the emblem for those of us who are perhaps reluctant to surrender to Krishna. We know we should. Uh, we know we would. We know we could, but we don't. And so Bali Maharaj is sort of our Mahajan. He's a Mahajan for the reluctant surrenderers. Because in just a few moments, when he realizes in no uncertain way that uh, things have got to change, he makes the change. And uh, he's praised for it. And of course, he has tears in his eyes because just as he's talking about his grandfather, Prahlad Maharaj, the son of Harani Kashipu, his great great grandfather, Prahlad appears there. And uh, with his lotus eyes, he begins to speak words of uh, wisdom. So um, in the commentaries to this, uh, there's a very nice commentary in the Harivamsha. The Harivamsha says that the, or Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that the, the, there's two types of fear. One is fear of material life and how my happiness is going to be taken away. And then for the devotee who has surrendered, the fear is people who will take my spiritual life away. And the difference between a demon and a devotee is the company that he or she chooses to keep. And so the devotee chooses to keep company with other devotees, people that remind me of my status as a insignificant speck at the feet of the supreme person an eternal servant of the Supreme Person. 
So people who remind you that that's your ultimate position, you are charged with the responsibility to uh, keep those in your life. And anybody that does not uh, help you to remember that, then you can be friendly, you can be respectful, but you allow them to go beyond your intimate circle. Well, how do I do that? Well, it's just a question of making a choice, making a positive choice for one uh, over the other. And in the Harivamsha, there's a great uh, comment that um, was a great story, actually, because which, which helps to explain these things. Uh, 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 and um, it is that uh, the great son of Brahma, who was the father of Kashyapa Muni, who was the father of um, uh, Harani Kashipu, uh, and therefore one of the uh, remote ancestors of Bali Maharaj, he had six sons. And these six sons, one time when they saw the activities of Lord Brahma uh, in his momentary forgetfulness of his elevated and lofty position, they laughed. And for that laughter, they were cursed to um, take birth again. And they took birth and uh, they were in a situation where they had to, uh, they wanted to uh, worship Lord Brahma in order to regain immortality. And the idea is that, you know, you've got to pay back, you've got to pay back for what you do. So if you laugh at someone, you have to serve them. Unfortunately, uh, they were, uh, in that lifetime, they were the sons of Kalanemi, which means that their grandfather was Harani Kashipu. And Harani Kashipu does not like any of his children or his grandchildren worshiping God or sons of God or the devotees of God. So he cursed them. He said, in a future birth, you are going to be killed by your father. So unfortunately, Hirani Kashipu knew all about sons who were being killed by their father, which is what he wanted to do with Prahlad, but he was unsuccessful. So these six sons, they took birth um, from uh, Devaki, uh, and Vasudev in the jail of Kamsa, and they were killed one by one by Kamsa. So then afterwards, um, these children, they went to the place of Bali Maharaj, Sutala. So when Devaki asks Krishna, please deliver my babies, those six babies that were killed by uh, Kamsa, your uncle, uh, please deliver them back to me. So. Krishna goes and they're delivered by Bali Maharaj, who's in Sutala. But the commentaries to this episode are that um, the six sons of Murici stands for the six enemies of the Vaishnavas, the six enemies of progressive persons. One is karma or lust. One is crowd or anger. One is lobe or greed. One is uh, Mohan illusion, mother and matsarya, envy and madness. And uh, when we have, if you like, killed these six demons, uh, then Krishna is born. As Krishna comes after these six children were killed. That is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary. That those things have to be uprooted from the heart uh, until Krishna then takes makes his appearance uh, in the heart. So, um, Prabhupada comments on the, what is the solution? How can we, uh, what is the medicine? Uh, what, what does the spiritual doctor say? How do we, we've got these six enemies residing in the heart, six diseases, you know, madness, greed, envy, anger, lust, uh, illusion. All of these are in the heart. How do we free ourselves? How do we become cured from that? And so um, the verse is that uh, the Rasayana, the Ayurvedic cure for all of these is hearing and chanting about the activities of Krishna. Now, many years ago, I was wondering that, you know, how is it possible that just hearing about the activities of Krishna uh, purifies the heart so much? 
And uh, my doubt was that sort of hearing about Krishna's relationships with different devotees. And I must say that my bhakti was very much, pretty much overcome by my tendency towards jnana, not in an official way or a sampradayic way, but just, I thought philosophy cures everything. And I used to look at the, um, used to look at the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. And it was all the relationships between this one and this one and this demigod and this demon and different episodes. And I would think to myself, well, that's all very well, but it's subsidiary to the main the main thing. The main thing is Bhagavad Gita, surely, because that has the philosophy. And Srimad Bhagavatam is sort of something we study. And the value of Srimad Bhagavatam is that it has the Bhagavad Gita philosophy in it. Unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> the value of the Bhagavatam is that it not only has the Bhagavad Gita teachings uh, of Vedanta, but it also has the teachings whereby we can see the relationships between Krishna and his devotees. So for us, it is important to know who was born of who. It is important to know who got angry. It is important to know who loved who, who hated who, who fell out with who, and who repaired the relationship with who. Because all of these are relationships with the supreme personality of uh, Godhead or um, devotees of the supreme personality of Godhead. And ultimately, we are called upon to make this very important adjustment in our heart that we surrender. And what are the six divisions of surrender? In the uh, Lakshmi Tantra, the Pancharatra, we find that there are um, uh, six ways of changing your life to accept Krishna as the focal point of your relationships. We're not saying that relationships should all be given up. Relationships are extremely important. But these relationships with the devotees of Krishna and Krishna himself, well, how can I have a relationship with Krishna? Uh, internally, everybody can have a relationship with Krishna, and you're called upon to do that. Now, Krishna may come to you through the devotees, but our rela internal relationship with Krishna has to be adjusted. So six things are there. We have to uh, understand that devotional service to Krishna is the way to please him, to be accepted back into his innermost circle. And everything that is favorable for that service to Krishna, we have to accept that. And anything that's not favorable, and anybody who's not favorable, for me being a devotee of Krishna, we have to reject that. As I said before, we have to do it carefully in a nice way. We don't want to be people with absolutely no friends. So make sure that you have devotee friends before you are alienating yourself from the rest of the world. And in fact, when one is a devotee, you make all kinds of other friends, because simply because of being a devotee anyway. But those people who are opposed to your being a devotee, those people who are, who do not remind you of your relationship with Krishna, and those things that challenge your ability to serve Krishna, ultimately you have to say, I can let this go now. If you've tried and tried, and it's still persisting, and it's still pulling you back, holding you back, then you reject those. We have to, Rakshisha uh, Titi Vishwasa, we have to accept Krishna as our protector. It means that no one else can help me. No one else can ultimately help me. It's just Krishna. No demigod, um, no crystals, no um, you know, different types of therapy, psychotherapy, water therapy, uh, all different kinds of therapies. Ultimately, the therapy that I need, the friend that I need is, is Krishna. And uh, not only to, to consider that philosophically, theoretically, but to ask Krishna to be your protector. And when you ask Krishna to be your protector, that leads into uh, what Bali Maharaj did, which was known as uh, Atma Nivedanam. Atma Nivedanam. Nivedanam means to make an offering. Nivedana, 
to make an offering. So I make a nice offering. I cut fruit on a plate or I make the kitchery, you know, and I, I put it on a nice plate, a clean plate, not anybody's plate, but a clean plate for Krishna. And I make an offering. But well, how about if my whole body and mind were that offering? <laughs> I ring the bell and I'm offering myself completely to Krishna. This is Atma Nivedanam. Another way of saying it is Atma uh, Nikshepa. Atma Nikshepa. Nikshepa means uh, when you um, you make a, oh, excuse me, Atma Samarapanam. Samarapanam. Atma Samarpanam means uh, I make a um, a consignment, just like I have a package, and uh, I put the package on FedEx. Okay, I'm making a consignment. I'm trusting that FedEx employee to take my package to Los Angeles. So I'm, I'm making a consignment. So that's called Samarpanam. And when you make a consignment of yourself, when you say, my dear Lord, here I am. Please accept this package and deliver it to the right place. Here I am. That's called Atma Samarpanam. And Atma uh, Nikshepa means to make a deposit. Nikshepa is a sort of a, uh, when you make a, a deposit account in a bank in Sanskrit, that's called, uh, uh, what is it called? Nikshepa, Nikshepa Leka. It's a, you open a deposit account. It means you're putting the money somewhere and you're not going to touch it. So when you surrender to Krishna, you don't say, uh, you know, I'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks to take my Atma back. No, that's a fixed deposit. You get the reward only if it stays in the account. It's like buried treasure. So where do we bury the treasure of the soul? The soul is our greatest asset. Where do we bury it? We bury it. We make a hole for it right underneath the feet of the supreme person. So Atmanic shape. And then finally, if we then start experiencing the joys and the pleasures of Krishna consciousness as a result of our surrender, what do we do? Karpanya. Karpanya. We remain humble. We remain in the attitude that uh, I have nothing. And because I have nothing, uh, I surrendered myself uh, to the Lord. And now uh, I, um, I, I've i got all these people who are, they love me because I'm a, a great devotee or they're giving me treasures because of I'm a, a great king. You know, this is, a, this is something that Bali Maharaj, the Karpanya, Karpanya, that all these things which are coming to me, because in the Bhagavatam there is a warning that he who becomes a devotee of Vishnu, all good things come to him. But he who becomes a devotee of Vishnu had better remember karpanya, the humility, that actually all these things are coming to me, but they're coming to me on loan. And just, well, Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj says to the Lord, Vamana Dev, in the presence of Bali Maharaj, he said, my Lord, he said, you gave him everything. You gave him everything. And he said, and you took everything away. And I consider your giving and your taking away to be equally beautiful. What a wonderful thing to say. So uh, if the Lord gives, we say thank you. We use it, but only in his service. This is Karpanya. So in the next chapter, we're going to go over to Bali Maharaj, where he has performed his Atmani Vedanam. And we're going to see uh, him. Uh, be placed in a, a beautiful place known as Sutala. And what a, it's a subterranean, subterranean planet, says the Bhagavatam. But just see who is there. The Supreme Personality of Godhead promises, I will always be there. And if anyone tries to take you away from me, I will kill him with my discus. So we should also aspire for a similar situation. That um, we are in a place where the Lord is worshipped. Whether it's heaven or hell, we don't care. As long as the Lord is there, we will continue to serve him. And if anybody tries to take our Lord away from us, my dear Lord, please remove him. Please remove her from my company.
Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Hare. Would, if anybody would like to ask a question, share a reflection or a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself. This is the time. Thank you all for coming in today. It's wonderful to see everybody. Adipush Prabhu, you wanted to say something? Well, I'm just relishing um, Bali Maharaj's contrition. Oh. You know, he's, he's sorry that he didn't please Krishna. Not sorry that he lost his kingdom, but he's thinking, my only criteria uh, for happiness is that my Lord is pleased. And that, that attitude was so, um, Krishna relished that and reciprocated. You want to please me. You are very dear to me. Mm. And a nice attitude. We all have our shortcomings and our mistakes and you know we don't always feel contrition beautiful the beautiful christian prayer lord i'm i'm heartily sorry for having offended you i regret my sins i regret my loss of you know access to the kingdom of god um, um i i certainly do dread the pains of hell but most of all i'm sorry for having offended you who are worthy of all my love Really beautiful prayer. I I'm sorry I haven't pleased you, Lord. And that's because Krishna is so wonderful. And, uh, he's always showing us so much love and care. So we we uh, were inspired to reciprocate with that loving care. That's intelligent. Most intelligent. We were speaking to a group of Columbia University students yesterday, 13 board members. And uh, they invited, invited us to speak. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I said, well, Krishna, please help me. And um, just sharing, I said to them, well, when, when we think of Columbia University, we think of intelligence. Uh, you guys are probably Gift, more gifted and intelligent than many people in the world. You're, you're in, a, in a university where they're uh, enhancing your intelligence. And intelligence is, there's a stratification. You can have higher intelligence. My neighbor, did I just tell you this? I was telling somebody recently, my neighbor has this little dog, a two month old puppy. And he, and he said, he, we're in front of the building and he said, this dog is so intelligent. I, was like, I said, what do you mean? He said, watch this. He put the dog down. He said, Raj. And the dog looked at him. He said, see, he knows his name. That's intelligent. <laughs> and, and then they put him about four feet away. He said, watch this. Raj, come here. And there were four of us standing there. And Raj went right to his him. He selected who was calling him. And then he said, when I say, Raj, you want to go out? He runs to the door. And when I said, Raj, you want to eat? He runs to the kitchen. You know, he's really intelligent. And he's so frisky, he loves to come out and run around. So the dog was running around on the sidewalk like this, really happy. And then he ran between two parked cars out into the street. <laughs> the dog got hit by a car. I was like, oh my God. You know, he's intelligent, but is he intelligent means to see the truth. He's going to be to see the, to see things. Fortunately, the dog wasn't killed. The car stopped and, <laughs> but what is our, you know, our intelligence is to see, oh, Rodham Rolidar, there we go. We, we don't have anything to say before Rodham Rolidar. Oh, glory to Prabhupada, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you so much for being my company, my good company this morning. You. I love Bhakti Sandra and I love Radha Rolidar and Gora Chandra and I love everyone. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Bali Maharaj Ki Jai. Shri Vamanadev ki jai, Trivikram ki jai, Rukrama ki jai, Hari 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 Bo.